for coming. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit more about the background of this, but um, we are from the University of Michigan. We're from the Open Michigan Initiative. And if you're interested in following along with the slides on SlideShare, you can do that. And we're going to talk, um, try to talk very briefly about some projects we've been working on and some research we've been doing. And there's a much more detailed handout about the methodologies, um, the background, our processes and everything on um, a Google Doc. So you can use that later if you have questions that might be deeper questions. But well, we're happy to, we're going to try to talk later. So, um, I'm, like I said, I'm going to be talking a little bit more about um, the research we've been doing around how we can build a community of sharing at the University of Michigan and really digging into what our community needs, what it wants, how it shares. So um, we've been doing a lot of different evaluations and research over the past year and a half. So um, I'll focus on that and Pete will be talking more about what we're actually doing with that research and what we've been doing in the last six months with that. So. A year and a half ago, we started on a very large, kind of broad evaluation and impact study because we've been around for a little over three years now at Open Michigan, and we really wanted to see what impacts are we having on our community at the university that we serve. So um, we did several different kinds of data gathering techniques, but we um, launched a survey in March 2011 that reached the entire university campus, and we have about 40,000 students on our campus. And uh, this survey was tailored to students, faculty, and staff about what their awareness of was of Open Michigan in general, if they had used the open educational resources that we published, what they thought about it, how they used those resources. But a big facet of this survey was also about their general sharing habits. So nothing explicitly connecting to openness or OER or open education, but just how do they share with each other? What do they share with each other, and why do they share with each other? So this slide is an example of one of the questions we asked faculty members about why they share. And so we learned some really interesting things from, especially the survey comments from this large survey. And one of the things, so you see some of the more typical expected uh, results from the survey of, that we, you know, a lot of people didn't know about us. We need to um, become more embedded in communications channels at the University of Michigan, figure out ways to make our open educational resources useful to our local community. But a big facet um, of what we learned was this need to start encouraging a cultural shift in learning toward openness. We realized that people are sharing, and they're doing lots of open things, but they're not calling it the same thing we were calling it. So how do we match that up? How do we start connecting with people in their disciplines at their levels? So we also have been looking at our own processes and analyzing the work and the, the processes and methods that we've been using to develop content at the University of Michigan. And we had developed what's called the Describe process that is a distributed participatory mechanism for publishing open educational resources and open content. It uses um, the talents and the interests mostly of student volunteers that we have hired a couple people. And we've had about 82 people participate in this process since we were launched in 2007. So we have exit interview surveys from the data that have other quantitative data survey, data interview data from them. And what we were learning was that the people that were working through the Describe process were connected with the kind of intrinsic values that we have in this. They are motivated by the same motivations we have. A desire to do good, a desire to share resources, a desire to provide quality access to resources with materials. And we did find that this process taught them specific hard skills. So they were learning how to use and apply copyright. They were learning how to use open licenses. They were learning how to search for and find open content. <clears throat> Another thing that they were learning how to do was shift a shift in perspective. So they were actually taking this training and these experiences and embedding them back into their discipline and daily lives, their daily academic lives at the University of Michigan. So you see that same theme emerging from the surveys that we did to this evaluation of our Describe process where the people that interact with us are starting to shift their culture toward just thinking about more open practices in general and sharing more broadly. So those were all good things. But we also figured out some more um, controversial things about our Describe process. We realized that um, the process itself is a very good mechanism for publishing content, 
but it's not a very good community builder. So what was happening was that these scribes who were working with us were being segregated from the rest of the community of individuals, faculty, departments that were working with Open Michigan um, because we had so deeply identified them with this specific process. And the very things that they were learning, the hard skills that they were learning, were actually, in some cases, barriers to them feeling like they were connected. So we were making them work through copyright issues and IP issues and publishing issues that were very tedious and rote work for them, very detail-oriented work, so that they could achieve that larger goal of doing good and connecting with other people and um, publishing access materials that provided more access to um, the broader global learning community. And so those were issues where we weren't seeing the opportunity for um, the community members to build their perspectives, to build their relationships, to build their engagement through the Descript process. It was actually being very proscriptive. So that was a challenge for us. We had to figure out how can we build community around different opportunities for people and different mechanisms for people. So as we were doing this kind of retrospective analysis of the last couple of years of our own processes, we also started thinking about the future and how we could take this information and move forward with it in a strategic way. So for the first time, we developed a mission statement for the Open Michigan Initiative that actually focuses much more on building a culture of sharing rather than publishing content, which is what we had started doing. So we're not so interested in publishing OER resources for, as a mechanism for engagement, but we're interested in figuring out broader, varied ways for people to engage in doing the things that they're doing in their everyday academic experiences, but thinking about it in an open construct. So we also started last year doing things like building out different kinds of engagement opportunities for people. So previous to this last year, most of the events that we put on for our community were training events that were associated with the Describe process. They were mentorship events associated with the Describe process and a little bit of community partnership. But what we've been doing in the last year is trying to connect with people where they are and what, with what they're interested in doing. So we've been identifying community partners, we've been identifying faculty members, student groups, and other initiatives on campus that are already engaged in projects that they care a lot about, that they want to succeed, and they want to share those things with other people. So Open Michigan has been able to provide our expertise, our knowledge about how to share well with these people and actually provide opportunities for them to learn with each other. And so this is an example of a workshop that we did that was um, inviting the community member, the community in general, to learn how to use Arduino and open hardware. So um, these were the kinds of things that we were seeing people really get excited about. And we were getting a lot more engagement um, and a lot more participation through these discipline-specific events where people were already excited about these things. And we were able to connect it with the broader concepts of sharing well, thinking about open practices, and starting to connect these dots and connect our community together. And so we have all of these different specific activities that we've been, been engaged in, and we've been doing a lot of this research that's kind of separate, but we're seeing this common theme emerge about really focusing on that um, community of sharing and supporting those different mechanisms for people to share. And so one of the things we started doing this summer was we hired an intern, Anna Shirakova, who's from the School of Information, who's been instrumental in helping us with this project. And she has been working on developing um, all sorts of processes, but one of the things that she did was stakeholder interviews. So we have the survey, we have the survey data, we have the Describe process analysis, and then we have this kind of engagement, face-to-face -face engagement that we've been very successful at. But how do we take that back to all of the individuals who are working with us to see what their own personal motivations are for working with us, what their needs are, what the skills that they want to gain are from working with Open Michigan, and those kinds of things. So she interviewed seven stakeholders who were people like instructional designers, librarians, students, and community members who had somehow worked with Open Michigan. And these are some of the things that we discovered were their interests and their needs. So how do we take all this information now, um, and how do we think about this, and how do we think about acting on this? And that's what Pete is going to talk about more of. So 
separate skills, all of the behavior sets, all of the um, needs of our community, and to provide various avenues for engagement and connection. So not just through that prescriptive describe process where you can either be a content contributor or you can be a describe to work with us, but we're trying to figure out how all people can, all the different people on our different our, on campus can connect with each other through their interests, through their needs, through Open Michigan and through Open Practices so that we are um, not just being this bottleneck of, in order to be open, you have to do it our way, and this is the one way that we do it, but we offer a, a, several avenues for connection. And we also want to start connecting our face-to-face -face community with each other, because we realize they think that they're often operating in isolation. And so how do we start connecting them with each other, acknowledging the work that they're doing, recognizing that work as participating and contributing to a larger open infrastructure and open learning practices at the University of Michigan, um, and what mechanisms can we use to do that <coughs> now? You can start talking. So, yeah, so as Emily was saying, we were realizing that our community um, really wanted recognition for the open practices they were already participating in and, and, and their efforts were already there. Um, but what was really interesting to us was that they weren't as interested in uh, being a part of this sort of larger new open community. They were more interested in taking uh, the sort of uh, advocacy role and expert role in openness back to their local domains. Um, and that really supports our notion of, the, of having this really distributed, uh, uh, decentralized sort of open activity structure. Um, you know, one where we can pass on understandings of how to share well to other people uh, in their own local contexts. So, let's look at what motivates uh, academics in general. And, and I, I'm thinking of academics as kind of the whole ecosystem with faculty, students, and staff, because we, we actually work with all of them. And this is by no means a comprehensive list, but this is something that we sort of aggregated from a lot of the feedback that we've uh, that we received, and, and we sort of developed some statements for it for individuals. Um, and again, what we're, if, if what we're trying to do is improve open practices um, where people are, we need to know what motivates them in that environment. Uh, so what we can see is that, you know, kind of some of the typical things that you might expect, like faculty want to build reputation in their field and want to have uh, better impact of their domain knowledge. Uh, and students want to sort of build relationships through shared experiences, and staff want to uh, sort of get more visibility and use out of their work that they do. Um, and all of these sort of motivating words here, you know, of sharing and, and gaining a, a reputation and, and making contributions to society, these all sort of scream recognition to us. Um, sure, I, you know, I, I want to go and do things and build stuff on my own, but in the end, I want to be noticed. I want to be recognized for the, the contributions that I make. And it's really too simplistic to think about recognition as a reward. Um, different people are, are motivated differently depending on the context that they're in. Um, so like, what motivates a graduate student to go back to school is very different from what motivates her to do the dishes. Um, and so we, we, need to, we need to appreciate that. Um, you can actually extend lots of different behaviors uh, or even create or, or habituate certain behaviors through rewards, um, but sometimes that's just not enough. Uh, sometimes rewards uh, just don't uh, don't actually cut it. And and the the the, the tasks that we need to do and, and the concepts that that we are trying to instill in other people uh, are just uh, too nuanced. They need they need better feedback systems than than simple rewards. Um, so that's when we came across badging. Uh, and so we, we thought about badges, and we saw a lot of people sort of talking about badges, especially at the last Open Ed Conference and the uh, Mozilla Drone Beat Festival. And so we are seeing badges as sort of a symbol of identity, um, as a way to signify to other people levels of achievement um, or character and participation in events, uh, as well as belonging to a particular group or a set of groups. Um, and so when we started looking at the sort of social communities uh, and, and systems that, that Open Michigan is trying to reach, we saw badging had quite a few potential applications. And so if our main goal at Open Michigan is to build this culture of sharing um, at the university, 
uh, we could probably use badges as a mechanism to sort of identify community members and to help them recognize one another as having skills in certain areas um, or, or sort of just be advocates uh, in their own local domains. So again, it's sort of bringing it back to where they are. So we, over the last six months, we've been working on some infrastructure. We've uh, been working with Mozilla and Peter Peter University and some other folks on helping design the uh, Open Badge infrastructure. And you can learn more about that at openbadges.org. Um, but then to link up to that infrastructure, we've also built a Drupal module that ties into our own CMS so we can administer badges and hand things out to our own community. Uh, and throughout this whole process, we've been doing a lot of thinking about sort of what open practices would, do we want to recognize, but also what uh, open practices would community members want to recognize for each other. Uh, and, and we came up with a lot of really cool ideas, uh, some that we'll probably have to throw out, but that's the fun of brainstorming. Um, so we have initially created some badges uh, that really are, are simple and, and focus on the basic contributions to Open Michigan. Um, and you know, so they, they, they range from like general community, community participation to uh, participating in the describe process or you know, publishing your first uh, resource at Open Michigan. Um, but our next set of badges are going to explore more, more detailed tasks uh, that are related to creating and using open content, being an open advocate generally, um, as well as encouraging other people to share work. Uh, and so what we're really excited about are really self-defined badges uh, where, where an individual can actually assess themselves for certain achievements or uh, provide feedback to other community members. So we don't, we don't want to be the only group that is handing out badges. We think that peer uh, badging is really important here. Um, so the kind of next, next phase of our badge work is going to be in the context of learning. And this is, I mean, uh, there's already lots of uh, um, debates and, and conflicting viewpoints about uh, the proper learning mechanisms and, and how badging might impede learning or how it might help uh, competency, competency building, etc. And there's a lot of different groups that are starting to focus on badging within learning, um, but they're really looking at certifying skills, etc. And our our interest is is less on that and more on helping individual learners set goals uh, for themselves in learning, figure out where they are and assess where they are in in, in their learning uh, sort of life. Um, and, and then figure out where they want to be and how to make sense of their educational and personal identities. So with that, I'll leave it open for some questions. I think the psychology of the motivation in the workplace is, has been around for quite a while. How different do you think these badges are as opposed to you know, the certificates that we might have handed out to our employees not about 10 years ago or even currently to some of us? Yeah, I, I think it really depends on uh, how the badges are created and how they're distributed. Um, so, if, again, going back to sort of the peer uh, feedback mechanisms. So, a lot of the certificates that we've seen in, in the professional societies are very top down, um, and, and there are certain uh, hierarchical social structures that say, okay, you've done this well enough for me to give you this badge um, or this certificate. But I, I think it's a lot more interesting to think about a very, very wide, variable set of, of pieces of recognition that individuals can, can pass to one another. When, you know, when I see you share something, I can go to your, you know, to your blog where you shared it and actually hand you a badge um, that maybe just says something. Um, and, and it doesn't mean that it, it has to be uh, you know, fully validated and certified, uh, but it is a little token of, of trust that you hand off to another person. A lot of this we found too was just a basic awareness of um, people who wanted to see who else was a, a, a fan, you know, at the very basic level. Like we have a, 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 an email list that we email out to people, but they weren't really using it very much and they didn't really know who else was involved in this stuff. So they wanted to just even connect with each other and figure out through their own disciplines where there was that commonality. I think I'm going to be a downer because <laughs> I have, I've had like a slightly different experience dealing with students um, and I have like a project that involves students collaborating on notes and sharing them online mm -hmm. and I've actually found that they're very resistant uh, to the idea and I've done some surveys too and maybe it's a difference between different schools and maybe it's because sometimes people say 
that they want one thing, but really they probably want another. I hope that's the case, but I, in my experience, it's about 65% say they would never share their notes or contributions with anyone for a couple of reasons. Um, one is that they want to get ahead. There's a competition, and sometimes for them to get the best grade in the class, it means leaving the others behind. Um, and two, a lot of students, and this is by far the most popular answer, are afraid that professors will accuse them of cheating if they collaborate with their classmates. I wonder if you guys have had any experiences with that and how you've helped get over it, um, whether it's a top-down model or just, I mean, you guys are the university, or you're with the university, so I think that helps. I'm outside, mm -hmm. so they don't, I don't carry much credibility. But I'm, I'm really curious to know how you've changed their minds about those sorts of things that you have. Well, we've actually encountered a lot of students that are already collaborating. And, and, and this is the issue of like, there are all of these different projects and all of these behaviors that are happening on our campus that we would call open, that they're not labeling as open. And so students are collaborating to co-create basically what amounts to open handbooks or textbooks. Study students, guides. Study guides. Yeah, well, study guides. And also, the, uh, there's an example of a handbook that um, is for global engagement. So if students going abroad, what do they need to look out for? Um, it's, it's health sciences related. Um, but then we also have examples of students who have self-designated um, wiki spaces to share notes and to pass on notes to different cohorts and to train each other about passing on notes to other cohorts and keep that system alive and developing. And we're trying to figure out ways that we can support th that behavior and make it even more open so that it's not behind a closed system. So I think it depends on th the avenue. Um, I think this is the issue of where when we were saying, you need to be open and you need to do all this stuff, that wasn't really resonating with people, but people are actually doing a lot of these things in their own disciplines and sharing for their own specific motivations. And we can connect through those avenues where they're already starting to share and say, hey, you can share even more and you can share better in these ways. You know, do you want to do that? And, and see how that builds out. So. Yeah, and I think what you're really pointing at, too, is that there, it's, there's an existing culture in some places yeah. where mm -hmm. sharing is not allowed, collaboration is not allowed. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and there's fierce competition. Um, one might expect that in like a medical school setting where we actually do a lot of operation, there'd be lots of competition. Um, but what we've found is that the students have been sharing notes with each other for over a decade. Um, and they've, they've developed online systems. And actually, they'll create a whole new online system every year to share notes. And, and certain notes get passed on like the Mathis notes have been passed on since 2002 to each class and, and they'll like update them. And so we're finding little pockets of sharing that it's really interesting and we, can, and we know that we can help them do it better. And so that's, that's what we're focusing on is, is finding where it already makes sense to people and then helping them do that better. Yes. Um, how does it like, how do you know if the bad badge is real? Like why couldn't I just like download the JPEG and put it on my website and say I'm sweet? Yeah, oh uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, that's, and so you should read a little bit more about the Mozilla infrastructure, and that's, that's one of the many issues with the whole open badging infrastructure is that uh, there are ways to sign badges and sort of validate them that way digitally. Um, and they, there's also this mechanism for uh, what, what we're calling badge baking, but essentially you're putting metadata into the badge um, and uh, you know, creating an encrypted hash, and then you can hand off that batch with the metadata sort of baked into the PNG. Yeah. Um, I can address that since yes. I was the one the badge infrastructure. <laughs> um, and that's exactly it. I, badges are not just a visual representation of your work, but they actually contain metadata embedded within them. And so when Peter was talking about um, baking them, essentially you pass information to Mozilla. We say, like, okay, you, you actually assign, so it's the issuer, who the recipient is, why they got it, what they did in, in order to get that badge. If there's a URL associated with that that you post on your server that actually represents that learning. So in some ways it kind of does, and we, we've heard some discussion about an e-portfolio. In some ways the badges kind of are their own little e-portfolios. Um, and so then we pass that back to the recipient, and the recipient then gets to push it into their backpack and decide whether or not they want to make it public. So badges are... Um, embedded with data. Right. And, uh, and when when people start counterfeiting your badges, you know you're a success. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
think we're out of time. Is Are we out of time? Yeah, so I don't know if we'll draw from lunch, but uh, thanks for your participation.